No, I think there's something in the air when you go to a concert which is not re reproducible. I think to give to begin with, some pianists and uh, symphony orchestras conductors play better with an audience than without. It's a well-known fact that uh, it's harder to sort of create an atmosphere. To in whom a is studio. it a well-known fact? I, I doubt this very very strongly. I think you might find, and, I, and indeed this is uh, I. I uh, I can easily cite this, it's perfectly true that Arthur Rubinstein, to name but one very great pianist, has said quite often that he is comfortable with an audience and decidedly uncomfortable in a recording studio, or at least it's a poor substitute for him. You must take into consideration his age, which is a remarkable one, and at which age he outperforms just about everybody else around. He's a magnificent artist, certainly. And since he says so, one can't say that, that he doesn't have some utility. Um, but I think you will find, if you examine the taste of a younger generation of performers, a much younger generation, my own or younger still, I can see a great change taking place today. And um, I've, I've talked to many performers in their 20s, let us say, who think of themselves not just as entertainers, or rather not at all as entertainers perhaps, but as um, quasi-creative people. This is, this is a new role for them. It's a role that's that ought never to have been abandoned. They had this role 200 years ago. Don't they're you coming think, back to it. Uh, forgive me. Don't you think there's an imbalance, though, in listening to a symphony concert in your own room, a room perhaps 20 feet long, which uh, just simply couldn't accommodate the 100 players of a big symphony orchestra, and you need the big spaces of the concert. But no room. more imbalance, surely, Humphrey, than, than sitting at, uh, at the left-hand corner of Festival Hall or the right-hand corner and hearing a cello and contrabass predominance, or vice versa, you know, uh, because the, the imbalance in concert halls uh, is astonishing if you simply move around a bit. Yeah. I think sure. the difference in kind. Still, let's, let's uh, move on to your personal relationship with, with uh, records. You've told me why you, why you uh, uh, gave up the concert hall. Um, had you, in fact, always wanted to give up the concert hall? Have you always <coughs> felt this about private music making? Yes, in, indeed. I didn't really want to become a performing musician at all. This was secondary to an interest in music in all forms that, that uh, I think I, of which I gave evidence at a rather early age. But the idea that um, to earn one's living as a musician, it might behoove me to become a performing musician was, was quite repellent to me when I was very young. And um, I stuck at it long enough uh, to confirm this prejudice, to, to, uh, to make sure that this was indeed true. And when it became possible to get out of that awful life, and it is an awful life, really, except for someone geared to a highly exhibitionistic sort of existence, um, I indeed did make the break and, um, and cut it out completely. Yes. And I, I now find it possible to satisfy myself as a performer as I never was before, because I can do enormously extensive projects in the recording studio. I can do the complete sonatas of Beethoven, I can do the complete sonatas of Mozart, all the works of Bach, all the works of Schoenberg. Whereas, had I remained a, a traveling uh, monkey on the concert circus, I would possibly, in the course of any given year, have done three or four Beethoven sonatas, because a great conservatism takes over the concert pianist, he, or the concert musician. He is terribly afraid to reveal the fact that he perhaps hasn't practiced long enough one particular piece, and he's tends to stick with a few works that serve him well and always get a good effect in a big hand from the top balcony. And is there any special way of studying music if you're going to make a record of it? Does it make any difference the way you approach it? I find, well, I find that my way of studying it, my whole approach to it has evolved because of the fact that I now no longer concern myself with uh, concert giving. In the days when I made recordings of music that I had tried out on audiences all over the place, uh, as evidenced by the Bach partita I played you a moment ago, tended to get worse and worse, so that by the time I got to the recording studio, it was cluttered up with all kinds of devices and tricks and cutenesses that didn't belong in the score. Uh, I tend now to leave the special study, as opposed to the general knowledge uh, of a particular score, to the last two or three weeks before the recording. And you so, know that all the Beethoven sonatas anyway? Yes, I, I've played them all since I was, uh, you know, really quite young. Um, so that it's not a question of, of not being able to recall what they sound like or even know what their tunes are. I do know this, and indeed I know practically all of my memory. But um, what I mean is that a specialized, a very particular look at these uh, sonatas is left until perhaps two weeks before the recording. That, that sounds mad, uh, suicidal, I know, but it works. Uh, so that what I do is not unlike uh, perhaps what an actor or actress would do playing daily soap opera, you know, for the ladies in the afternoon where they learn their lines one or two nights before and forget it immediately they've done it. What I forget is not the work, not the notes, but I forget this particular relationship to the work. So that in, in a, well, I, I'll give you a very good example of that. Um, I recorded about three weeks ago now, the Beethoven Emperor Concerto with Leopold Stokowski. 
And we had not worked together before. In fact, Stokowski uh, does not often make concerto recordings. I think he t tends to detest all soloists on principle, for which I can't really blame him. Um, so that we got, to, we got together about three days before the recording, and uh, I, with some temerity, said, Maestro, um, I want to suggest to you that um, my tempo is going to be your tempo, but nevertheless, to uh, also put up a case for two possible ways of doing this concerto, of making it feasible. And one of these ways uh, employs a very slow tempo, and the other employs a rather fast tempo. You'll have at to least, show me this. yes, certainly. At least as far as the first movement is concerned. Here's way number one. The other way is something like this, rather conventional. My great delight, he said, number one has far more character. We must do it this way. What had led you to choose those two tempi, Don't go away, because I'm trying to ask oh, you to I am? All right, very well. Well, um, what had led me to choose these tempi was um, a feeling that I ought not to trod any sort of median line. I ought not to take too much a course of moderation, such as could be found on perhaps four or five other gramophone recordings widely available and played by excellent musicians. By which I mean, I think there is a necessity when you make a recording to do it differently, to, to actually cover new ground. And I think if you can't find, uh, with conviction, new ground, uh, one perhaps ought to leave that particular work, either until you found such a cause for it, um, or an, until you're uh, convinced that perhaps the median way is the right way. There is, there is nothing uh, against doing something in, in a quite orthodox way, but I think it's important, especially in making recordings, that one actually contributes a totally new view. One, uh, one in fact, recreates the work. One, one turns performance into composition. I think this is the key to it. Well, I think really what you're telling me anyway is that you almost have to recompose the music when you go into the studio. In a certain sense, yes. Anyway, yes. go on with the Stokowski story. Yes, well, um, it w turned out to be one of the very happy collaborative experiences of my life, I'm, ha I'm proud to say. And um, we did do it in a, in a very grandiose and, uh, as I say, mock Napoleonic fashion. I think the Emperor Concerto has never been subjected to tempos quite that slow, perhaps. Um, and it, it came off, uh, I think, as an eroica with piano accompaniment, uh, which is exactly as I would like to think of this work. But what is special about the recording process in this? I mean, wouldn't this have been the same if you were 10 years ago making, going to play a concerto performance with... with I'm inclined to think, Humphrey, that if you subjected a concert audience... Well, I have. I must say, I once played with Igor Markovich, uh, the Emperor Concerto, almost at the, at the slow side of that spectrum. But I'm inclined to think that, generally speaking, if you deliver that sort of performance to an audience uh, who are not able to have it dissected for them by a microphone that can suddenly come in on the horns going ya ti ta ya ta ta sort of thing but but who tend to sit back and let this great nice blur wash over them that they would be bored stiff but beethoven didn't and intend. i'm afraid of boring them stiff. beethoven didn't intend you to have this horn suddenly picked out he surely had the sound of the theater in vienna in mind when he wrote the piece well, but we're not playing it in uh, 99 times out of 100 in the theater in Vienna. In fact, we're not playing it in his theater in Vienna at all, are we? So we don't know what uh, he would have had in mind had he been thinking of a sound in the Royal Festival Hall or a sound at Lincoln Center or a sound in Frederick Mann at Tel Aviv. He obviously would have treated the horn differently had he wrote a commission, written a commission piece for, uh, for each such hall. Do you ever find that you um, uh, land yourself up in the recording studio not knowing how to tackle a particular problem. Is it always, yes. Does it always work out for you? Not always, no. And it, this, this has happened. Um, it's a frightening experience because one somehow feels that um, with all that can be said about the electronic wizardry of recording, with the fact that you can come back on an endless number of days and try to find the right mood, that nevertheless one has a certain professional commitment to get through it. You know, you have a contract to produce so-and-so many recordings consisting of such and such works within a given period, and obviously they must be done. Can you, make, a statement. can you make interpretive decisions after you've made the record? In fact, can you do what the listener's going to do later on in your millennium? And that's cut from one to another. Yes, yes. And indeed, some of my very best decisions are made this way. I, I think that, um, <laughs> I think this is another part of the future that might shock you, but, but uh, in which I strongly believe. And the best case I can make for that 
is on a very recent recording of the last fugues from volume one of the full tempered clavier, the well tempered clavichord. Um, one fugue in particular had bothered me a little bit. It's, it's a difficult fugue. It didn't bother me so much because of its difficulty. It bothered me because of its lack, the, the, the lack of clarity that, that uh, was accruing in every statement I made of it. I, I recorded it eight times in the studio on one particular morning last March. And um, it's a fugue that begins this way. We did it eight times. It takes one and two and three and four. We're sort of careful, you know, because one is worrying about playing wrong notes and that sort of thing. And that's a hangover from the concert experience, too. It need not be really a concern in this new, free, brave world and so on that I'm describing to you. Um, take five began to get with it. Take six was extremely good and indeed was some place in the mold of that performance that I just started to render very pomposo and allegro majestico, you know, great, great character, rather Germanic. Uh, indeed, a bit too Teutonic, perhaps, but but forceful and lots of bite. Then we did take seven, which was no good at all. That was a letdown. It was a denouement after this. I just couldn't get up to it again. Then we did take eight, and take eight had it as well. But take eight was totally different from take six. Instead of take take eight was positively skittish. It was something like. very lovely. It was a little too grazioso. It was a little too delicate for the structure of this music, but it was nice. It, it sounded as if one had suddenly shifted to the upper register of a harpsichord and mm -hmm. played it with a new stop, you know, a new registration. So we left the studio thinking, well, we have a good fugue because take six and take eight are both very good and they don't even need to be spliced up. They're fine as a performance. Spliced up, you mean uh, well, it, joined together? Joined together and correct wrong notes, this kind of thing. They were both fine from beginning to end. That's no special achievement. It's only a couple of minutes long. But anyway, um, they're fine and we can leave them alone. So we went, we went home happy. About two weeks later, we had to sit down and actually listen to this as a final result and see whether it was going to make a good recording or not. We went into a playback booth where one listened to such things. And... Um, we found that they were both disastrous. They were monotonous, terribly monotonous. Uh, take six went on forever in this incredibly pompous way. It was like hearing the most conceited uh, Central European conductor tell you how the inflection of the Beethoven violin concerto's timpani statement should go. It was so persistent, you know, it was forever. And it went on in this incredible way and, and never had a sense of humor. It never smiled. On the other hand, take eight was skittish as all get out. It was great fun for a while, but then you got tired of this. It was just too capricious, and you felt, you know, will they never stop thinking how clever we are in this, uh, all these four voices? Will they never stop carrying on these insane little dialogues and cutenesses between themselves? So we sat back and thought, would it be possible to make one super statement of this piece that combined take six and take eight, using the best parts of both? You because mean, you mean you re recorded it? No, not at all, not at all. The, the, the combinator factor came into play because we discovered that they were both done at exactly the same tempo. There was no change of tempo. That's unusual, but there wasn't. They were exactly the same. Um, let's say it took 2 minutes 40 seconds in one, it took 2 minutes 37 seconds perhaps in the other. Mm -hmm. So we found that it was indeed possible to make these statements not only adjacent, but to use them in such a way that the, the pompous take was used for an introduction one can fairly well be pompous, you know, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, my subject tonight will be, this is the exposition, and this was the, the take, this was the, the kind of take we used. At about 14 bars into the piece, where we've heard all of the, um, the introductory comments, we suddenly shifted over to the skittish one, and from yada re de da, we got yada de da, yada da da de da, and I'm sure that, that uh, anyone who buys that recording will think, you know, what a wild idea. And indeed, it, it would be a wild idea had it occurred to me under the pressured conditions of a concert performance or even uh, in a studio in the ordinary course of doing. And it only came about because one was able to sit back and take a very reflective, leisurely view of this thing and say, what can we make of it really? You know, uh, is our role as an interpreter so limited that we can only say that 
our fingers are, are good for a day in the studio and then we're done with it? Or can we, in fact, sit back like a film director with his brushes and say, now, what have I really mm. got here? What can I put together? Is there some way I can crystallize a statement that makes this better than I could possibly think it out a priori before the fact? And this is what we did. We made a great fugue out of that. Please finish by playing it. All right. do that would be a pretty lively discussion and I think it was. You can also see why a lot of conductors and perhaps other pianists got upset by some of Glenn Gould's theories and I'm now in the rather unenviable position of having modestly to try to sum up his views after which he's going to play a piece of music right through from first to last presumably without any splices, joins, artificialities, anything except just the music itself. To sum up his views, I think he's probably wrong about the total decline of the concert hall and the opera house. I think there will always be people who want to listen to music as members of a community rather than as individuals at home. On the other hand, I'm sure he's right in thinking there'll be a huge expansion in home listening, whether it comes through records or television or whatever medium the future produces. And I think he's also right about this question of listener participation. I think the listener is going to take more trouble to create the sort of sound he wants in his own home and mold that sound according to his own wishes. And I think he's perfectly within, him, within his rights to do so. I don't really think Glenn Gould is right about do-it-yourself Beethoven, the splicing together of different performances to create one's own performance, though I happen to think this is a pretty harmless pastime if you like to do it. Really, basically what he's saying is that the listener of the future will participate much more in listening to music, in responding to music, and in creating the conditions he wants. And I think this is unquestionably a healthy development. It's a creative development, and I don't think there can be very much question about it at all, any more than there can really be any question about Gould's standing as a pianist, as a musical thinker and as a force in music in the mid-20th century. <laughs> 